Okay, so John chapter 15, where we continue and uh, we're in the farewell discourse, uh, which is really the heart of the gospel of John. So much here, so much here. Um, we're, we're taking our time walking through all this. It's great to see everybody. I see you guys all in the, on there. Hey, Joanne and Maria and Angela and Joy and, and Kathy and everybody um, and Freddie and John and Aaron. It's good to have you guys with us, Latanya. So, okay, John chapter 15. Um, you know, these are these are familiar scriptures because we read them a lot and we go back to this a lot. And uh, this is great stuff. And really the heart of Jesus' ministry and our relationship with him. You know, you have, you have to remember Jesus knows that um, this is his last night with the apostles and um, he's he's loading them up. He's loading them up. He's saying he's saying his farewell discourse and uh, they're paying attention. They're listening and he's talking to them. Are they understanding it all? Probably not. And we'll know that from the from the things they do in the next few hours, but things that they will remember and things that will be with them forever. I think a lot of times we 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 have to remember that um it's it's okay that we don't understand it all. Sometimes we get frustrated or we think, "Oh, you know, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is." Don't worry about it. Get what you can out of your initial reading. You always get something. And then you go back later, you'll read more and as as we get older as Christians, which I see on here a lot of veteran Christians, um you know what I mean. We go back and every time we learn a little bit more, and then even out of listening to a class like this, you're going to learn even more. And the truth is, I'm not getting everything out. You know, this is this is a quick, uh, you know, I love to squeeze orange juice. This is the quick squeeze. Uh, you can do the thorough one where you get every little drop out of the orange. We don't even have time to do that. This would be a 50-session class if we did that. But there's a lot to be uh, gleaned from here, a lot to be learned from here. So we jump into John 15. And here's the, the the final times that we're going to be hearing the I am statements. And he says, I am, or I, I am, the true vine, and my father is the gardener. You know, Jesus used many symbols, many references to agriculture, to farming, that, that they would all understand. Of course, this was an agricultural society. Uh, they, they probably passed through many vineyards. They, they understood the basic concepts of vineyards and how they work and a vine and pruning and things like that were very normal to them. Those of you who garden, you will understand these concepts even better uh, if you've taken care of plants and grown any kind of fruit trees or anything like that. That's one of the great things about California is we we, we do have so much fruit here and so many uh, ways to, to grow our own food. And he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And it's interesting because he sets it up somewhat, it's, it's, it sounds a little bit like a, a living parable, not a classic parable in the sense of a story that, that you know, was supposed to have happened already or, or that was made up. But here he's giving an analogy and he's giving us a very, very clear understanding of the roles that he is the vine and our father is the gardener. This vine story, you know, of how this works appears in all the Gospels. It's in Mark chapter 12, Luke chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, and here we are in John chapter 15. There are stories about vineyards. And and so it's a very, very common understanding in, in, in Father God as the gardener. He says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Again, if you've ever grown your own fruit, then you know that you know when there's dead branches or dying, you clear them away so that they don't take any of the en energy or the nutrient from the plant, so that everything that is bearing fruit gets all the nutrients and all the energy. Like, like I just I I just did it a few months ago, and it's time to do it again. I have orange trees, and they got all these little shoots coming up at the bottom. Those are not going to be be fruit bearing shoots, but they are taking nutrition. So what do I do? I get my little gardening scissors and clip, 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 clip. I clip them all away because they're not going to be fruitful. And I want the branches that are bearing fruit. I'm so excited. I have an avocado tree. And yesterday I counted 14 baby avocados. 
and I'm so excited about it that, uh, you know, so I was, I was thinking, okay, I got to trim all these dead branches away, make sure all these little babies are getting all the nutrients and the energy that they need. So, and there's actually, there's, there's a couple of concepts. He talks about trimming and it talks about purifying, you know, that, that some of it is trimming, you're cutting off branches. Some of it is purifying. There's dead, there's, there's branches with just some dead leaves and I'm cleaning it out. There's spiders in there. There's bugs in there. I'm cleaning all that out. Uh, the word is actually catharos, which is where we get the word catharsis. You know, something purifies us. It cleans us so that we can be our best. You know, I know a lot of us do detoxes in January and and we can tell. You can tell when people are doing de detoxes. Their faces glow. Their hair looks great. Their eyes are bright. You know, you can just tell when people are doing De detoxes, they function better. Um, that's the same idea. So he says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now there's going to be a lot of talk here uh, about fruit. Um, and, um, and you know, the, I've, I've heard the debate, the age old debate is, is he talking about fruits of the spirit or is he talking about the fruit of discipleship? And, and there's every indication that he's talking about the fruit of discipleship, meaning helping more people to know God, not the fruits of the Spirit. Now, could it be the fruits of the Spirit? Yes. And would it apply? Yes, it would also apply. So it really, it's a, it's a stupid debate, really, because it doesn't matter. Both apply, and both would be true. Now, sometimes people want to get off the hook of, oh, you don't really, not everybody. There's a school of thinking out there that not everybody has to reach out and bear fruit. You know, that that some of us are good at bearing fruit, some of us are not. No, all of us need to bear fruit. And our fruit may be different, and we may play different roles in bearing fruit. Some of us, you know, are better at reaching out to people. Some of us are better at building friendships with people. Some of us are better at sitting down and explaining the scriptures. Some of us are better at challenging. Some of us are better at, at encouraging and nurturing. Yet all of us need to be part, play a part in it. All of us need to be involved in bearing fruit, whether you're good at it or not. You know, I mean, hopefully that, that you get to use your talents but also that doesn't mean that, well, I'm not going to reach out to anybody because I'm only good at building relationships. No, we all do our part. We all we all uh, try to bear fruit. And he, and he notices, he, and he says that um, as it's trimmed and as it's pruned, as it's purified or cleansed, it even bears more fruit. Now, you've probably seen that. Or if you're gardening, you've you've done that where you trim back. I remember my, my aunt and uncle, you know, they're like the grandparents of the whole family. And they have all these fruit trees, man. He cuts those things back to nothing. And then the next spring, it's like covered with apricots and covered with, with peaches. And and then the next fall, he does it again. He trims it back. And it looks ugly for a while. And that is the Christian life, right? We get pruned. We get challenged. We, we have to change things. And we may look ugly for a while. It may look like we got a bad haircut, you know. And, 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 and yet, that's what leads us to being more fruitful, to being more like Jesus. Um, and that's a, that's a concept that I think in, in a lot of ways we've drifted away from that. And we need that. We need to be pruned. We need to be purified. We need to be cleansed. And God is always working towards that. And you know how God works. He doesn't always appear in, as an angel or writing on the wall. In fact, the vast majority, 98% of the time he appears, he appears through a friend, somebody talking to us. Somebody sharing with us, somebody challenging us, somebody preaching at us. That's how most of the time he reaches out to people. That's why I love the story of Nehemiah so much, because Nehemiah was a person just like us, right? That's what we're told. And 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 he heard he heard the Bible just like we hear it. And he had his convictions and he acted on those convictions. And God used them in amazing ways. Just like us. Just like us. We he's a great prototype for us. So it says. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And you know that this is this chapter is both very encouraging and a little scary. And a little scary. You know, if we're not bearing fruit, we're a dead branch. We're a dead end branch. You gotta stop and ask yourself, why am I not bearing fruit? 
if you're not helping people become Christians, if you're not helping people to know God, if you're not helping people to get to heaven, then you got to ask yourself, why not? Where, where, where's your fruit? Where's what, what's happening? And because we don't want to be the branch that gets cut off, right? We don't want to be that one. And there, make no mistake. I mean, he was, he was, he was saying what need to be said here. We need to be a fruitful people. Now, here's the thing. He explains it. We'll keep reading. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Now, so he says, because we listen, we're reading our Bibles, we're praying, we're being cleansed by the Bible. We're being, our heads, our brains, our thinking is being pruned and cleaned by the Bible. You know, it tells us what to repent of, what to grow in what we need to be, and 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 also as we share scriptures with each other, which I hope to see a lot more in the future, that we're not just sharing our thoughts and ideas with each other or our opinions, but we're actually sharing scriptures. And that way the scriptures are being applied specifically to meet our needs and to help us. And that scripture, that word, is cleaning us because it's Jesus' word. And he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. And notice there in verse 4, it's a two-way street. It's not just um, make sure I remain in you. It's also remain in me. Remain in me as I remain in you. So we're connected, and it's both ways. Jesus is devoted to us, but we also need to be devoted to Jesus. It doesn't just magically happen. We have to have that devotion that we are remaining in him, that we're purpose. And that's that's basically what living an intentional life is, that I am purposely, consciously trying to stay close to Jesus, trying to stay in him and walk in him. One of the, my favorite terms is just in him. That's what, the, you know, a Bible, t- the, Paul talks about science things, is, refers to that of being in Jesus, Right. And we are clothed in Jesus and Jesus is being formed in us and we are being transformed into his likeness. And so he's in us and we are in him. So that's a, that's a very intentional relationship that, that we just, we wake up every morning and we affirm it. We, 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 this is what we do. We pray, we connect and we stay centered in Jesus. You know, there's, there's, there are many, many times where I'm having a rough day and I know I just I gotta go to the backyard and sit for about five, ten minutes and just get plugged back in. I can feel myself unplugged. I can feel myself disconnected. Where I'm getting thoughts or feelings I shouldn't be getting. And so that means I gotta stop, I gotta do a timeout, put myself in timeout for a few minutes, reconnect, recenter myself, refocus myself. As I've said in sermons. I have to recalibrate. <laughs> it's like a like a telescope. I have to recalibrate it, put Jesus back in the center, back in the focus, and then I'm good. I'm good for the rest of the day. You know, or or if it's a really bad day, I might have to do that a couple times, but but uh normally not, you know. But but the point being that I have to stay connected, I have to stay in there. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Okay, and I think this is an incredibly important lesson because here's the thing is that that some of us are shy and we're not really good at reaching out to people. And the only thing that's going to help us get out there is Jesus, basically praying and really walking with Jesus. Uh, But some of us are actually pretty good with people. We're pretty outgoing. We're we're just kind of naturally good marketers and and we can get people to church. We can get people to church. We can talk people into things. And be careful with that. Because what can happen is we start doing our own thing and we're not remaining in him. We're not relying on Jesus. And I think that's why God doesn't give anybody all the talents. You know, I mean, the the people who are really good at getting people to come to listen to God's word or to start reading the Bible they tend to be not so good at going through the studies and, and building that relationship. Um, and then the people who are really good at building relationships and being deep tend to be not good at just cold contact, 
inviting people or reaching out to people or, or something. I mean, all of us, I don't know what your strengths and weaknesses are, but I know you have them both. I know you have strengths and I hope you know what they are because you need to know what they are. God gave you strengths, but he also has some built-in weaknesses and, and, and that's why we, we, we need Jesus. We have to depend on Jesus because the bottom line, nobody becomes a Christian because the person reaching out to them is awesome. Now we can all get help and we can all see Jesus through the person reaching out to us. I remember uh, um, my professor said something that really bugged me, but I couldn't get away from what he said. He he said in a class, he said, you know, um, love is is very powerful. He said, my family grew up, and he talked about the traditional religion his family grew up, and he said, my neighbors were Church of Christ, and they started reaching out to us. They helped us in some hard times. They just loved us through thick and thin. Well, he said, when his father passed away, they were there. They were always helping them. And so his family all end up saying the Bible and becoming members of their church. And um, and he said, you know, we saw Jesus in them. They helped us see Jesus. And I thought, wow, that's great. He said, then he said, he said, now, if they'd have been from this religion or that religion or this, we'd have probably become that religion. And I thought, no, 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 people don't become part of a religion because of because of the people that reach out to them or because of the, the argument. But then I realized, no, that's not really true. It, 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 he's right. He's right. It's because that's how powerful love is. And because Jesus is love, people see Jesus in somebody and they'll join whatever that somebody is doing because that is the powerful magnet is love. Love works through and that's how we see Jesus. That's how the world will see Jesus. Again, why Jesus talks about love so much, right? He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So, so we cannot depend on our talent. And it's the scary thing. The more talented you are, the more likely you are to, to, depend, to depend on your talent. And that's the double-edged sword of talent is that it's a great tool. It's great to have talent in certain areas. And we all have talent in something. But it's also easy to depend on yourself, whatever you have that talent in. Thankfully, we all have weaknesses. Thank God for our weaknesses because that makes us turn to Jesus. That makes us get on our knees and pray and remember that if we're not connected to Jesus, we're not going to bear fruit. And so if we have not borne fruit in a long time, we got to stop and ask ourselves, am I living connected to Jesus? Am I connected to him? And here's the thing. I've, I've always, I've always known, uh, well, not, I haven't always known. I learned this, but I've known for a very long time that the way to help a church grow and be fruitful is not by preaching evangelism. It's not by, you know, pushing everybody to have a visitor every week, pushing everybody to be in studies, pushing everybody to bear fruit. That's that's like out there going out, and if I just started squeezing my avocado tree and, and trying to force it to bear fruit, it doesn't work that way. It's the same thing. It's a healthy connection to God, a healthy connection to Jesus. If our fellowship, if our church is walking with Jesus, it will bear fruit. First of all, everybody's looking for love. Everybody is. If we are glowing with love, we're going to draw people. And notice that in Acts, when it talks about the church, it says the Lord added to their number, right? People were trying to join them. That They, they had to filter people because they had some wrong characters trying to join them. And you even read about that in the book of Acts. Read about Simon the sorcerer, you know, and, and they had to be careful but because they're such a loving, incredible group, everybody's trying to join them. Okay, that's how it should be. And a healthy church is a wonderful group of people. Who wouldn't want to be with them? I mean, they're so loving and they're so giving and they serve one another. And you walk into church and, I mean, it just you walk in and just look around and see the, the, the diversity of the group. That alone is, whoa, that's so different. Because most churches are divided racially. 
Everybody who's black goes to one church. Everybody who's white goes to another church. Everybody who's Hispanic goes to another church. Everybody who's Asian goes to another church. And to walk into our church and see that diversity, that right there tells you God's doing something. Because that's not natural in human nature. That is spiritual. That is pure spirit, right? So so everything of the spirit will bear fruit. The, the better our connection, the more fruitful we're going to be. So I'm not saying we don't need to, you know, discipline ourselves or even challenge ourselves to get out there and reach out to people and remember to call back and remember to pray for them. Remember the remember the habits that help us bear fruit. But where that comes from, all of that comes from loving God and being connected to Him. Nobody has to teach a mom, you know, to to love her child, to feed her child, to to take care of, you know, to give the child medicine when they're sick. Nobody has to teach that. Now, you may have to teach specifics and what foods, and, and they're going to want to know all the specifics and all the million questions they have, but it's built in because that's what love does. Love finds a way. Love protects. Love cares. And so the person will just naturally find the answers, right? It's the same thing with the church that's walking with Jesus that's walking with God, they're going to want to go out and reach out to people. They're going to feel the pain of what's happening in the world. They're going to be the light that shines in that world. They're going to be the magnet as they are love loving people. So he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You know, that's, and and honestly, this is this is probably one of the most indicting and challenging verses right here because we're not bearing a lot of fruit right now, which means, which just tells me clearly that we're not that connected and we need to be better connected. We need to have a stronger connection with Jesus and we need to be closer to him. And he says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. This is that scary part I was talking about. That if we don't bear fruit, and it's an interesting thing because I find that a lot of times the most fruitless people are also oftentimes the most critical people of the church. And that's crazy. That just doesn't, it's just crazy, but that's, it often happens. You know, who's bearing fruit out there and who's, and that's, that's, it's just going to be a sign of our connection with Jesus, with God, that we're walking with him. And if you've been having great quiet times and you haven't borne fruit lately, you need to be faithful and trust that you will because it's it's just as much a promise is that if we remain in Jesus, we will bear much fruit. You know, I, I figured out one time, just stupid me, but I calculated, I was figuring out how much fruit have I borne, you know? Well, one sense, you can't count it because you don't know the impact of your words, the impact we do. So there's lots of fruit that we bear that we know nothing about. We don't even, we're not around for them. You know, I went down to Mexico a few years ago to help the church in Mexico City, and I met a guy, and we're talking. He's one of the leaders of the church. There's four leaders, and they lead it together, the four of them. And it just came up in a conversation who he studied the Bible with. And it's a guy that I met and reached out to when I was there 25 years ago. And, and, and so I was like, wow, you're my spiritual grandson. And it's like, so in a sense, he's my fruit, you know, but that happens. There be, there's going to be people you meet in heaven. You didn't know anything about him here. So, the, you know, take heart and encouragement in that, that if we're sharing about Jesus, if we're talking about God, if we are sharing our faith and understand that sharing your faith does not mean inviting people to church, inviting people to church is great. But that sets you up so that you can share your faith. Sharing your faith means sharing your faith, talking about what you believe in, talking about Jesus, talking about God. And that bears fruit. That's what draws people in and repulses a lot of people. But um, but so this is a scary one. He says, if you haven't borne fruit, you're not bearing fruit, then you, you, you need to make sure your connection with Jesus is great. And if it is, you need to be faithful and just hang in there. Hang in there. The Lord will use you. And maybe there's some tricks and things you can change and, and work on that will help you. Um, but just stay faithful. Persevere. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You know, so walking with Jesus, it's a powerful life. It just is. 
And it doesn't mean you're perfect. doesn't mean you don't have weaknesses. doesn't mean you don't fall sometimes. But incredible things that happen that would not have happened without Jesus, that would not have happened without this walk with God. And those of you who've been around a long time, you know what I'm talking about. And he says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, in the end, he comes back to this very powerful statement that by our fruit, we show ourselves to be disciples, you know, that we, that we're showing again, which fruit I say both, but definitely the stronger argument is the fruit of discipleship of helping other people to know God, helping other people. You know, the first, uh, about the first 25 years of our Christian life, not one person became a Christian in our family, even though we've talked to our family, we've shared with our family, and we just oh, we're always praying for our family. And then, boom, nine people in the next ten years got baptized in our family. You know, and that's that. It took a long time. It took a long time. That was a lot of seed planting and watering over the years. But boom, and we're not done. I got a whole bunch more people that I would like to see walking with Jesus in a great way. But um, but I'm so excited to see how much my family, my earthly family, is growing spiritually and how many of them are, have turned to Jesus and more of them are heading that way as well. So, so it's a good thing, um, and it's to God's glory, to his glory, that we bear much fruit, and if we stay with him, we will. So we're going to stop there. Time is up. Had a great uh, little study. This is the Nuti Gritti right here. This is good stuff. And uh, I'm going to take a peek, see if I see any question marks. Nope, I don't. A lot of amens. Great. Love you guys, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.